I'm breaking right now my promise of don't do talks about the exhibitions in the gallery. And this one was on request of one of the rules of the grant that Maxi Espina, who is the author of the fantastic installation that we have right now in the gallery, uh, when he get the grant was part of the requirement. So we'll, we'll try to do it as light and relaxed as possible. Um, I promise him that I will, for those of you who have been in some of the previous uh, discussions about the gallery used to be this kind of a, a district attorney approach to architecture conversation is not that my intention. Uh, I, will let, I will let Maxi to, ha to hang himself uh, without my help. Um, so my job here is to throw softballs and, uh, and Maxi as a, as a Princeton graduate that he is uh, to get him himself in trouble all alone. <laughs> Um, so, no, but jokes aside, it's really, uh, I hope everybody has seen the, the exhibition. It's really a fantastic one. Um, I think Maxi uh, and his firm, uh, Spina Good, done a remarkable job. So I, I thought that to start, um, it's kind of a softball, but probably it's not, because I think it's, it's, it's quite a, I would argue is the question with this kind of installation, which Nobody can say that architecture installation is a new genre, but at the same time, we cannot say it's a very old one. So it, it, it still is, is in a state of mutation in which it never defines itself, neither to be an architecture work in the traditional sense, neither to be uh, an art piece in the traditional sense, ne neither. So they're always floating around in this ambiguous territory. So to, to me, the most important question always to any of us who have to do one of these exhibitions is, how much an opportunity like this became either a platform for a proto-architecture, it became a project by himself, it became a test of ideas that you want to do, or is a piece of a project that you will do in another context. So, and, and, and I would argue that pretty much any architect can give you an answer in relation to any of them. So I will start with that one. Uh, that's a great question. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I'm Maxi Spina, if uh, needed to be said. Um, so, I think that's one of the, the first things we, uh, that we ask ourselves. I mean, what is an installation uh, at, in this particular moment in time uh, after in, in, in a place like Sire Gallery where it has had a history of 15 years of uh, several projects a year. Uh, and for us, um, that question had to do, given my own background, uh, with uh, drawing and with uh, material technology, in this case, building assembly uh, and building construction, and how this topic or this problem of thickness uh, could address uh, that, uh, that relationship. So how does one bring an interest on drawing without the project itself becoming a drawing? How does one bring an interest on uh, graphic procedures to represent uh, the world of materiality without that being a flat piece um, uh, on, uh, hung on the wall. So uh, that, that was one of the first questions that we had uh, uh, when we started to write the grant and to kind of uh, propose this, this particular problem. And uh, we did so because we found that this, this problem of thickness is something that uh, it usually finds you traveling back and forth between the, the world of representation and the world of construction. And not necessarily the kind of realities of construction, but how it wants to represent those realities in a way. Uh, so for instance, uh, something that you'll see on the show, uh, this idea of uh, hatching whatever is solid on a section, it's something that we took very literally uh, and that we represented with uh, a certain sense of directionality with, uh, with these uh, with this laminates uh, that, that make up uh, all the installation. Uh, so, we wanted essentially the product to fluctuate in and out. Um, the you know its its graphic effects, uh, its its uh, ideas of composition as a drawing, but also to exist uh, out in the physical world uh, and uh, and not be apologetic about form. Exist in the in the kind of spatial world in the gallery, and we wanted we wanted several scales of engagement. We wanted. Um, people to see them, these things as objects, which it's in the end what they are, but we also wanted them to be under, to be on the side, to 
essentially uh, triggered them to uh, to visit these pieces uh, on the you know on the round at 360 degree and to understand that that this is it's both a specialized drawing uh, but it's also something that reflects on uh, the the material world how how um, uh, laminates are put together how surface um, uh, technologies it's it's put together uh, and and with a sense of composition that starts from the drawing and ends uh, on the installation. Um, this is not a definite answer of what an installation ought to be. I don't, don't want to present it that way, uh, but it's some it's it's an open uh, set of debates that we had at the office when when you know when we started with this with this project. Um, the 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 second one is actually. I've been in a lot of this conversation. I, I don't remember we ever asked this question, which I think is an important one, which is the majority of the shows that we put in the gallery are what I will call pedagogical shows. They're not a museum show, uh, even though the results may be not that different than if any of the arch architects will do an installation in a museum. But here they come with the requirement that this is a workshop and a class that the person had to teach and work with the students the mechanism. So Maxi, which is one of our faculty here, and, and we tend to do, I think, we, I think we are coming to, I think there are very few faculty left that they have to do one, and if you are in the audience, we will get to you eventually. Um, but I, 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 and again, I, I don't remember if we ever asked the question about what was the role of that, which is different again when you do something in your office, you just do it and then this one had to have that ambition also to become an instrument for learning and teaching and so on. Uh, how do you guys approach it that? So that's a great question. Um, we always were debating about whether this product ought to be something that culminates a set of ideas that you have tested before, meaning a gallery that, a product in the gallery that needs to be uh, like an art piece, it has to be a perfect, it has to, you know, it has, some, it has to be something that you've done several tests before. Uh, we approach it a little differently. This is probably a year-long project. It started with a set of questions that we investigated in these smaller um, objects uh, uh, that, that started with these chess sets, and we make it out of wood. And then I brought that problem to my studio, uh, and and we started my students started testing it there, and the product started to evolve uh, along along those lines. Um, in in you know, it's 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 been amazing to work with uh, well, with with my students, uh, undergrads and grads uh, throughout this. I would say two months, not really two weeks, um, uh, in in the in the side gallery. But it was it was for us a, a risk project. I would call it. It wasn't uh, something that will answer all the questions uh, that this topic of thickness and representation and, and materiality and how that 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 problem mediates it too but rather we'll, we'll open a set of questions. Perhaps we'll answer a few in a, in a particular way, uh, but, but we didn't want it to be uh, the kind of culmination of um, you know, a longer career. We just want it to be a set of kind of, if you want, um, uh, young ideas, something that is uh, you know, becoming, essentially. Uh, so it, I also asked myself the question, what, what is this going to lead to? In a way, uh, and and I don't, I don't know if that I have an answer for that yet, uh, but uh, but yeah, I hope that answers uh, um, your question. Let's stay with the issue of representation because I think this is um, is clearly a topic that is floats in, in in the space here in Saya, but I would say in many of other schools, which I will consider part of a family of a schools, and there's almost like a traveling circus of characters. Um, but th this is an issue that has become, in re not so recent, but probably in the last five or six years, it has come back with the vengeance in terms of the discussion. But it, it came with a whole new series of filter lenses in the sense of, and, and this is my own take on it, and, and I think your project is different, and that's why I, I really like the, piece, the pieces a lot. Um, but it has to do with this, uh, what I would call um, this notion of uh, the digital nostalgia of the desire to reclaim a genre or a logic to work that belong to a different period of time and refilter it through the mechanism of digital production and so on. E even in the aesthetics of it to make the drawing look like they were drawn by hand or they look for a particular time. 
Uh, I, I will say at the same time that the pieces don't look at all nostalgic. So in that sense, I think you and G are, 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 whether you like it or not, they're part of an ongoing conversation about people who are exploring some of this relationship. But what I think it makes your work different is this still has uh, a kind of a much more unapologetic formalism built into it. So the representation is not so much a kind of a nostalgia fetishization of it, but it still is a tool. But nevertheless, there is some flavor, some spices of this, what I call the nostalgia of something that you were not part of it, which is a strange thing. So, um, yeah, this maybe is the kind of a asshole question <laughs> in, 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 in the conversation. But I have to ask it because it's something that fascinates me uh, why there is this desire to make things look older than what they are. So It, it is a good question. The Portlandia uh, effect. Uh, it, it is a good question. I don't, again, my answer will be a provisional one. I will let, um, um, you know, perhaps my generation or people slightly younger than me uh, in future installments of these, of these kinds of Q&A to answer for them. But, but for us, um, I think the, the formalism, it's, it's something that definitely looks at certain aspects of history that I, I became interested in. Uh, when I lived in Rome a couple of years ago, uh, I was teaching at, at a different school uh, at that moment, and I just became interested in the in the Roman ruins and in and in Roman buildings, but also in the, in the way they were represented. Um, so, so you see, uh, flipping around the drawings of of Auguste Rossi, of of uh, Roman fragments, and I became fascinated not just with the form, but in the way they were represented and how they reach a kind of synthesis about both line, the art of drawing, but also about the, you know, the kind of forms that we're trying to describe. So that kind of, that kind of marriage is what, what pushed us to, you know, to explore this more slightly uh, postmodern uh, kind of uh, uh, formal genre. Another thing that contributed to that aspect, perhaps it's a, it's a show, It's more, it's more in the drawings. Yes, the, the drawings do have that tint, uh, perhaps because wood, it's a nostalgic material that we all can relate to and we can call, I don't know, I hear people use it adjectives like warm or cozy when we, when we talk about wood as a materiality, which in this case is a little bit of an ironic thing because you're, we are all thinking that, and we refer to this thing as wood when in reality is a plastic with an image of wood on it, with a fake texture of wood applied to it. Uh, so it has that, that, that ironic edge, which is like we build with these materials that uh, have a certain meaning that is codified in the way we understand architecture, uh, but in reality they obey to a, to a, 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 a pure, uh, uh, effective way of uh, constructing things now, uh, which are hollow, lightweight, have to be transported flat, and so forth. Uh, so the drawing is trying to play with that edge, which is this material that we all think and remember what it is, but in reality has become a complete different product uh, that um, that you know that we're trying to engage uh, in the uh, in the manufacturing and composition uh, of the pieces. The larger part of the question is the, where I don't know if I have an answer for. Uh, I think. Perhaps the way I can, I can answer it right now is I am interested in these drawings to speak to a certain set of precursors, um, perhaps very old precursors. In this case, you know, as I said earlier, the, uh, the drawings of, of uh, Auguste Rossi or, or Rondelet that begin to approach the question of thickness, but also the question of shading, the question of um, you know, uh, representation of, of the built artifact, in this case, ruins. Uh, and um, so, so there's something nostalgic about the ruin, but it's also um, perhaps, uh, to me, more about having a conversation uh, now about what digital tools can begin to take a spin on that, on that problem that is very old, in a way. Uh, so that perhaps is maybe a definition of nostalgia, in a way. Um, the, the material thing is an interesting What I, I think you're absolutely right. I think this is something that we see more and more, the idea of, um, 
what I would call fake materiality, right? I mean, the idea that something looks like something that is not. Uh, and clearly, uh, actually, is one of the things I find incredibly appealing about the pieces, is the idea of this sense of boldness. But also, it's a particular laminated booth. It's, it's, it's one that reminds like the cheap furniture of a grandfa grandma's house. It's not, it doesn't pretend to be a luxurious furniture. Uh, like a, it looks like an old laminated uh, cheap furniture. So there is something really interesting about that idea. That it, it's different, that I would argue, than some of the other exercises in fakeness, which is the idea to try to deceive you that you're really getting into something that is way better than what it is. So it's neither also the modernist honesty, the material is what the material is, it's neither this idea of fake luxury um, that some, some people start to have, like new cars, that they have this kind of a similar leather thing pretending to be leather instead to embrace artificiality. So it's something else. But in relation to that, there is a fundamental, for me, there's a fundamental disparity of effects between the two pieces in the front, which are painted white, or I don't know, they're painted or laminated white, either way. Uh, they, they produce a completely different effect than the one in the back. Because the one in the front, I will say, it belongs to the territory of the abstraction, if you will. And it has a much, it will be easier to identify. When the one in the back, they are a little bit much more disturbing. They, they have something like, a, I would not say quiche, but they have some kind of a burlesque quality, or almost like a lower form of art versus the one in the front, which is supposed to be more, oh, these are the discipline, you get this one, you know this one. The ones in the back is really what we are interested in. Why the desire to produce that dichotomy? It was accidental, it was more, let's try something else? It, it, it's a great question, and it's one that we, we struggle with until the very end, I have to say, because it's the, that idea kind of, uh, uh, mature as the project got constructed. I'm not going to lie about it, but but it 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 is meant to uh, be emblematic of the split in which we think of a certain product in the computer, in software, in model form, in the abstract, in a way, right? And at some moment, that product begins to acquire certain tints of materiality and begins to get, you know, um, you know, it begins to compromise in a certain way with things that perhaps you didn't want, or perhaps you material that you didn't know, and you had to you know, follow the conventions to work with that material. We never worked with laminates before, in a way. So, so the front room, or the ante room, as we call it, is essentially the product closer to the architect's working table. It's a little bit more abstract, perhaps because it's white, and it's smaller, and it's more manageable. And, and, and in so doing, you can be more attentive to details as you are working on a model. You can bend over it, you can, you know, you can, it's a, essentially a big model. And the pieces on the, uh, on the larger room, on the back, uh, they are, they're essentially how all those ideas begin to enter into different uh, degrees of, of material compromises in a way. Uh, and how do, how do you begin to, um, you know, assign, um, uh, uh, thickness, how do you plan for thickness in the computer, in a modeling software that is not meant for that, that is, a, you know, a, a, everything is uh, extremely thin and, and thickness is something added, it's an elusive condition, it's something that you have to uh, usually, you know, in, in, in a lot of projects I've left it until the very end, uh, you know, to assign a certain thickness just for the thing to stand out and uh, stand up and resolve all the physical parts of the world, so it doesn't, you know, it's aesthetic, doesn't get compromised. So, so what we wanted to do this, in this project was essentially to turn that around. It's like, how, how do you begin to plan for that condition? Um, how, do you, how do you bridge this split between texture mapping and the kind of stereotomic uh, kind of effect that we, we were after uh, in the show? How do, you, uh, how do you begin to compose the grain of, of a material that you know, usually is very hard to plan for? Um, and you know, so again, the project doesn't put definite answers into all those questions, but it try, it's trying to approach them uh, with you know, a certain um, a sense of formalism uh, that, that, is, that has its it kind of reminiscence in these in this Roman ruins that I was uh, describing earlier. Uh, and, and then it, it enters into this um, super pragmatic uh, uh, contemporary construction world, which is the one of hollow materiality, uh, super lightweight uh, materials, in this case, uh, ultralight MDF, 
uh, and and these extremely thin laminates that 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 deceive you that you're looking at at wood, uh, but in reality they are they are an image. Um, and you know this is something that we we looked into uh, the, um, the the sculptures of uh, Richard Arschwager that that. Uh, that that have that kind of you know that kind of quiche uh, a theme to it in which it it shows you very familiar forms like an altar with a very familiar materiality but in reality it's something uh, hollow and and kind of devoid of any of those of those meanings but at the same time you know embodies those meanings. Uh, um, uh, let me ask you about something actually way more simpler. Um, the role of, uh, I will say, the, well, there is the overlapping of layers, but also there is the relation between the degree one and the degree three geometry, right? The, the role of the curvature versus the role, and all the curvature, they all seems to be, every curve is always a piece of a circle, but in some cases are more evident than other one. In yours, there seems to be that all of them are pieces of circles, so there is a desire to read all the time the platonic geometry is what they belong to. There's not a curve against a curve, if I, if I am correct. Yeah, uh, I, I never love. So how, um, I mean, what, what are the ingredients in the balance of that? I mean, how much curvature is enough? How, how, how much is not enough? How, how much of straight line? Um, or is just, OK, there is a procedural thing, and you let it run the course, and eventually we got this. I mean, because it seems. It seems that there is uh, what I will call, um, what we call designing. <laughs> what we used to call designing, uh, uh, which it seems like a bad word these days. When it's very common to say, what do I do now? Well, now don't you design it. You establish, it, you establish the rules and whatever. So where, I mean, it's not really a tricky question. I'm really asking very straightforward. Is it how many curves do you think is enough? I mean, do you use enough curves? Can you use more curves? Do we have enough curves, enough straight lines? That, that question has, I think, two legs. One is a stylistic one, which is how much you're pushing uh, this material, this this form, and and um, and if you have the you know the kind of desires we had in order to to achieve a certain kind of craft with the pieces, at some moment you have to restrain yourself, given you know time and budget. Those things you know probably everybody in this room knows about that. So I'm not going to go on on that on that line. But the part where I do engage with that question is, we were just talking about um, a documentary about Frank Gehry, uh, I don't know where you are, there you are, uh, that they are doing of, of his buildings in Australia, and he was asking me about, after seeing the show, uh, how thick are his buildings? And I told him they're, they're very thick. They're extremely, th they're, they're sick and thick, and, but they're not heavy. They're hollow and they're thick, so there is this, this split into the way we understand uh, thickness, and that, and that is directly related to curvature, right? Like once, once you begin to do all these more extreme formalisms, given the way the material world acts now with um, layers in which each one of the layers resolves a certain different kind of problem, then you end up with a much more uh, spacious envelope in a way. So, for us, that question, we wanted to approach it with a certain degree of control. Again, we didn't have a lot of experience with working with laminates. Um, and uh, so, so we wanted to work with control curvature, uh, but we wanted to make the viewer uh, ask a set of questions once you look at, it, at the pieces from different angles about how thick is this? Is this an offset surface in which the radii on the back side of the radii on the front are the same. Um, are, is this a constant thickness throughout extrusion or is it changing? Um, and uh, it is, it's, is there a kind of common or a, or a standard for the way you assign thickness from bottom to top in each one of the pieces? And I think curvature is related to that because at some moment, if you, if you in some moment, the, the product essentially kind of negates offset as a single condition. Uh, it begins to work with variable offsets or variable uh, projections of a curve in depth. Um, so uh, at, at some moments, it can afford to be, like the pieces on the front that we were referring earlier, can afford to be as thin or, Im or imply thickness as much as they want because their scale and the way they sit on, on the pedestals uh, and so forth. Uh, but the ones on the back can 
not have that luxury. They need to essentially compromise, I was saying, with the, with the world of construction. Uh, so certain curves begin to get um, they begin to get thinner. They actually, this piece that, that you're looking at right now pinches at a moment which is uh, almost a, a dangerous pinch, materially speaking. Uh, but we we you know we we figure how to how to resolve it in a way. Uh, so so you know so so its form would hold up, not just just the piece itself. So if I understand your question correctly, we I, I you know I didn't approach curvature as a as a topic in and of itself, but rather about something that will, down the line, once the pieces acquire uh, at, at its solid properties, uh, will, will essentially trigger you to, to look at the pieces in the round, and, and, and not from a kind of top-down logic of solidifying uh, the, you know, the, the kind of formalism, but rather with a more variable one. I think the whole thickness effect without curvature you can achieve it, but I think it's, it takes way more, way more effort. Uh, the, 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 the other on the obvious question segment that we are, which is something that I always find very interesting in the context of this gallery and other exhibitions and galleries is how to deal with what is the height of the pieces. I mean, how, how to determine what is the right height to control the space. How, how you guys come to that? Conclude because your has been some of the tallest than we have in a while. So Arabix was taller. Uh, yes, F but it was yeah, but yeah, but he put it in the yeah. center. Yeah. Also, uh, it, it is it's a good question. Um, the it, was, it was a whale <laughs> jumping up the water, <laughs> and not three grandma furniture pieces in the gallery. <laughs> So it's not the same problem. <laughs> These are over, oversized grandma furniture pieces. I think that's it. <laughs> um, it's a good question. We uh, we. We wanted, again, piece, uh, uh, the viewer to be partially underneath, uh, partially on the side. So we wanted the question of posture of the pieces, but the posture of the viewer uh, with all the setbacks, with all the back and forth and all the gymnastics that the, the section begins to do to question your, you know, your own proximity to these pieces in a way. Like where, where is this a, a kind of ideal or a, as we call the vantage point to look at these objects in a way, and I and I don't I don't think that's only one for every one of these for every one of these objects. Um, so the height, the height more responded to that kind of question uh, rather than um, rather than the, how the pieces will look in the gallery. Um, the the project establishes a set of datums, and they're all pretty much the same um, in which. You know, it's a two-part datum. It has a, a number of bolts at the bottom and, and at the front and, and so forth. Uh, so those sets of heights, not the entire height of the pieces, begin to approach also to, you know, a sort of question, can I sit there? Can I, I don't know, can I lean on this thing if I were allowed to in a, in a gallery? You know, so, so there is a kind of posture, as I was saying earlier, of the, of, of the physical object. That that it indirectly relates to um, you know to the viewer's body uh, that that I was we were interested in in exploring. Uh, the last one before we open to the audience. Um, the, this also I think is is one of the always kind of a crucial questions in relation to this. Um, which again, uh, one could argue that they are a genre by themselves, but I, I will I will say the big majority of architects approach these as an opportunity to explore things and one hope it will keep evolving. The question to me always have to do with some of the things that I think architecture installations allows a higher degree of freedom, not so much on the budget and material because those, are, those resemble certain similarities with any other architectural problem, but the fundamental difference has to do with the notion of uh, functionality or usefulness. I mean, these things are empirically useless and in a way allows them to be pure in a level that architecture in a larger context cannot afford the luxury to be, uh, despite the best effort that many architects always, we always try. So I always wonder um, what are the negotiations of the idea that you develop here, how they will start to deal with that. I'm not talking about the real world or the client itself. I'm talking about the notion what some of these more uh, again, I really believe that true great architecture is always defined 
was its uselessness and not because of the usefulness. The things that define the great project of architecture are things that, are, that cannot be quantified, they cannot be usually monetized. They're all things that are really unnecess unnecessary in terms of functionality. But what I'm talking about is the idea how some of this speculation will negotiate the moment that they start to have, need to have a door, or they need to start to have a bathroom, or they need to have to have a staircase, or basic make a room. By making a room, I can see it very easy. So, and it's not specifically about this installation itself. It's much, about, it's much more the logic about the opportunity, how you move the pure state of uselessness of an architecture installation genre into the notion of architecture as something that has to perform some sort of form of occupation. How, how, how you think that that can evolve out of this? Is, if is the, there is a, such thing as a straight line between those two things, maybe it's not. And maybe you can say, no, you know what? This is a whole territory, and when I do this, we're approaching these problems, and then what we, so. I always interested in how much percentage each of the architects who deal with these problems will be able to carry on or not, and if that matters. I think it's a great question. I mean, I think it's a question we ask ourselves. Um, we ask ourselves that question in this project from coming from the, uh, from the chess sets, like how, how what you're doing scales up, how does it live up to uh, a larger scale, spatial problems, material problems, and, 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 you know, and the meaning and functionality that comes with that. Um, in this project, we only resolve perhaps the, the material ones and the technological ones and the, and the kind of effects that one can, can uh, begin to engage with at, at this scale of approximation. Function, it's, it's, a, it's, a, tricky, it's a tricky problem. Um, I think as much as I would like to, I think at this moment in time will be a, it will probably be a mistake to, to try all these things directly on, um, on, a, on a building or in a, on a kind of client-based project. I don't think they're yet ready to engage that world. I think um, there's something to be said about, you know, how much to allow these um, incipient set of questions to engage with, uh, you know, with the strictures and the, the constraints that exist out there. And I'm, I'm conscious that this doesn't answer all those things yet. Uh, but we, we did some tests. I mean, a, a lot of these, of, of these uh, at least the formal side of the exploration started a year ago uh, with, uh, with the, the Mali competition, which a number of uh, people here did, including yourself. We, of course, we didn't, we didn't win, but we started it. it exploring this, this kind of uh, uh, um, formalism. Uh, and the product still, as you said, it doesn't, it doesn't engage with the, with the notion of aperture. Uh, it, it, it just tackles certain uh, ideas that had to do with the edge, which has to do with this ambiguity of being thick and sharp, uh, which is, in and in of itself, that is a certain kind of functionality, but not, not all the functionality that a piece of architecture uh, um, should respond to. I mean, that one of the definitions of what what an installation is is it's a reduced building problem, right? It's a it's a it's a kind of dumbed down building problem, and you decide how how you reduce it, what issues you exclude, and what issues you tackle on it. Um, I believe at 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 this moment, the product is perhaps ready to go into stage 2.0, but 2.0 is not not necessarily um, the outer world. <laughs> it's perhaps ready to engage on, uh, or, or able to receive uh, another degree of, of, um, uh, of constraint, uh, or another imposition, another compromise, if we want. Um, I think I'm, at least that's the way I see it. I mean, the, the last thing I will hope to see is that, that, you know, that, that we all of a sudden take this as if it can exist out there, uh, I think that, in my opinion, I think that, that will be a mistake. That will be, uh, it's like throwing a, a soccer player when he's 15 year old uh, into, into a field. It only works a couple of times, and uh, if you're not ready, then you know, that takes a toll, uh, and, and, and I, I, will, I will be cautious in that regard. Um, I would like it you know, to open to the audience if you guys have any questions or comments for Maxi. Since uh, I want to have uh, some time for that and not rush it, like we usually do. Maybe just a follow up on what you were saying. Um, when you think about it from that standpoint of all observing, I'm just curious if you have any issue with the scale of your position there? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, I will naturally probably answer slightly bigger, but I don't know if that's necessarily good. <laughs> Um, perhaps I will, uh, yes, I mean, I, the scale is now the part where I am uh, probably referring to in, in terms of the, the 2.0. I think uh, it will be... You have to be careful. There could be clients in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should be more like, yeah, sure, we can make it huge. <laughs> We, we can make it huge. It will just, the time of development will, could probably be uh, slightly longer than, than if the piece was already fully mature uh, to address all the issues that one has to when, when face, you know, a product in the, in the real world. Um, Uh, it's interesting you're, you're thinking of these things. I mean, they're, they're definitely the interior pieces, and they, one of the functions they don't resolve is, I don't know, uh, how they shelter from water or so forth. Uh, but perhaps, and if I interpret your question correctly, it has to do with knowing that this material is mostly used for countertops, right? It's an interior condition, uh, and, and raw wood, uh, if, if this was real wood, um, it will be something that will age really quickly uh, outside. Uh, perhaps because they, they do have the, the kind of relationship to furniture in given its scale, and again, the material doesn't uh, skip that problem again. I think it's always present. It's very hard to think of these things abstractly as what they are, right? Like they are enlarged uh, grandma's furniture, as as I put it, but but furniture is there as a, as something that we relate to that 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 make this look slightly or awkwardly familiar in that regard, right? Um, I personally didn't start thinking about this uh, as as interior pieces or even furniture. It just that's what the product became as we approach the question of materiality uh, as it enters this kind of formal world. Um, the formal war, I think, it also in some levels contradicts these things being as, as furniture. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, canyon bolts that, that it produces, it, it, it does a certain, uh, produces a certain hint to building parts, uh, which this is something we wanted, to, we wanted to work at that kind of junction. So I don't, I don't know if I have an answer for you about whether they are interior pieces. In my, my, my take, I think it's, it's they are not, but I also will see why somebody reads them that way. That, that, that's definitely true. I mean, I think the 
how the, the curvature begins to lean towards you or, or away from you in the taller parts of the, um, of the pieces is something that makes, um, it makes the form a little bit more uh, kind of spatially encompassing or kind of hugging the viewer rather than, than being, if, you know, an object. I don't know, I'm just lagging out of precise words to describe that condition, but I think you said it better. I, I do think that I can relate to that, to that being in piece of interiority, that question what's interior, what's exterior in that regards from the concave convex, uh, from, from the way uh, you describe it. Sorry, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, it's been, it's a great question. I think it's, it's been a focus ever since we did this uh, chess project at Giant Jazz, which is um, a Sire alum that runs this amazing architecture gallery here in Chinatown. And we were part of a, a, a sort of uh, uh, architects and designers that were asked to like design a chess set, or chess set designed by an architect, um, which was a, was a tough question and that eventually brought up the, the question of, of, of the profile. Uh, and Personally, it's, we are interested on the profile, not just from the formal aspect of it, but, I, but also from the point of view uh, that, that it's that very edge of thing that begins to question how you read uh, uh, certain forms in a way. And it's been pointed out in uh, particular canonical projects like um, Casa Girasole uh, um, uh, in, in Rome as well. Uh, that uh, that is one of the projects in the uh, you know in the middle of the century that begins to suggest this turn towards a postmodern condition that the profile acts as a kind of as a moment in which produced uh, I'm just using Eisenman's word this kind of undecidable condition that he uses that word borrows from from Derrida in in terms of like like it questions your ability to read something as purely solid or as a surface and it triggers that kind of uncertainty that kind of ambiguity which is, you know, something definitely more postmodern than, than modern. Uh, the, the profiles here uh, start from, from that interest, but, but in reality they are something that started with these with this chess projects and with this idea of um, both extruding or turning things uh, and working with the kind of control formalism that comes out of, purely out of that. Um, now it has generated a family of projects that perhaps speak to each other and, and um, you know, and perhaps as, as you're, you're saying that our work can be identified uh, in, in, with, with that in that regards. Um, it, it's, it's an open question to see uh, how these question of profiles begin to engage uh, the question that had been asked earlier, uh, larger uh, uh, building problems function uh, and, and so forth. That, that's very interesting, yes. So I think uh, uh, 
it's a mixed success in that respect because it still can be seen as the near. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think it's a difficult decision. I don't know how I would deal with that, but uh, to double down and erasing Um, I think it's a great question. I think, so the, the cheap looking, uh, I think it's perhaps because um, the, the, the notice on this, that this material is a laminate, that is thin and that is fake, it's, unless you have all the time in the world, it's almost, given this formal appetite, it's almost impossible to hide. Right. And I don't think that was our goal. I think it was, let's get close, but let's not go crazy. Uh, let's not get, try to get Swiss on a product that, you know, that, that doesn't, it's not going to do that. Uh, we, we did want to play it on that edge that exists between the way we represent uh, or, you know, uh, the solid world with hatching uh, and all these all these patterns that we make up and that we understand, that we give, taken as a given to understand that materiality behaves in that way because we've seen it in drawing, right? Um, when in reality, when you go see those things in real life, say, oh, you've been drawing this thing a certain way and it turns out to be that, I don't know, it, it's doing some other things. So we wanted to, I don't know, perhaps abstraction could be the closer word I can get to in this, this world of, you know, um, uh, construction analysis and, and kind of construction representation of, you know, uh, of, of these kinds of uh, uh, material fragments. How to bring that aspect of uh, a person that, 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 that works on drafting or, or, or uh, drawings of sections that knows about this into um, the way this is uh, uh, materialized or almost shaded, right? Like the, the composition of the grains on the, on the pieces is something that, you know, begins to um, address certain aspects of how things are, uh, uh, how they produce a certain depth or how they produce, um, you know, how do you see them in perspective and so forth. Uh, the later part of the question is the part where I, I'm having difficulty answer whether to go for more with the, with the abstract or with the, with the banal. I think, I think there are necessary uh, counterparts for the product to be, to be what it is and I don't, I don't necessarily hold banal as a, as a negative connotation to the product. I think it's um, at some level, everything we do is, has a banal aspect to it. The question is how do you, in my opinion, uh, take a spin on it in, in, in which you let it get associations that are disciplinar. Like if I had just played with the, kind of the, the cheap aspect of laminates, and not bring any disciplinary architecture questions, then I would say, then that wasn't a success. Uh, but, but I think let it impregnate with all their aspects of drawing and ask somebody to go back and forth between those two worlds. It's something that I, it's, it's the product that I think it has a little bit more of, of future in its, um, uh, in, its, in its time. And my partner wants to answer this question. As, um, I will make an argument for 
the straightforwardness of, of the uh, of the issue, which is, I think what makes um, I think the material is cheap and that, but I don't think I what I, I think it doesn't make it look cheap is I, I think it's the ability of the form. Is it, it reminds us of the power of the form as the one to make something to elevate. It's not different, let's say, that when a fashion designer decides to work with cheap fabrics. And it's through the ability of the design, of the complexity of the manufacturing of it, that the quality emerges. Not necessarily because the cotton or whatever, the silk is the highest quality and so on. It has to do with other qualities too. So that's why I think, uh, in that sense, to me, that, that's, from my point of view, is what makes the project fascinating. And I think it's better, as much as I like the white pieces in the front, from the pure prone of taste, I think the pieces in the back with the veneer of, of the of the of the uh, of the cheap the cheap quality reminds us to cheap furniture in the past, which by the way also had to do with a different time and era on production. Because I will say that today we have a lot of high end things that is made out of stuff that 30 years ago wouldn't be considered cheap. There's a, there's a whole other parallel conversation which I don't think is part of your guys' installation. But I think it has to do with also with a completely change of culture in terms of what we consider uh, like, a, like plastic as a moment was something cheap. Not cheap of produce, but it was considered cheap. Today, plastic is elevated to any other high quality product like other. So uh, to me, Yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 yeah, the hatching to me was never so, in my head at least, it was not so, to me it was much more about the distortion of the familiar and through the manipulation of the formalism to elevate or hide the material limitation. That's why I thought it was interesting in a sense. That's why I think this makes this work for me not to be really pomo, neither to be modern, modern is neither. It's something else because it's not really, it's not really trying to trick you that it's fake. It's, it's not fake because I, I'm not trying to trick you that this is a high-end boot piece. Neither is, is cheap because it's cheap. Is 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 some is is. Yeah. Right, because you, can't, you don't have enough money back in the issue. Okay. So I think uh, to then use it, you know, for other yeah. artistic purposes, you know, it, there is a problem of uh, how to politically position yeah. the value of the, uh, the designer in relationship to the uh, consumer. So but I think it's a very interesting yeah. aspect. And I think it's part of the politics of the argument. Like, you will see side high end fashion companies that they take pride that what they do is not leather. They make a whole defense of animals, sustainable argument to really charge you the same money that will charge you for leather for something which, in terms of durability and then whatever, is an inferior quality, but it has a political symbolism that also has a value that change. So it's something that I think in architecture we still struggle because I still think we are under the umbrella of the morality of modernism. And I think it's, it's hard for us to shake it off. And either you produce like a cheap version of certain things, or I don't know. It's a, I think it's a, it's a fascinating problem. Like this idea that these materials were born about that. Yeah. Yes. They, they do, I mean, before we go on, I do want to thank them publicly because I know we're on record because they have donated about half the sheets of the 130 sheets that we have used in this project. Um, but, but they do have it, you know, we know the material to be what this is, which is this laminate, but they have a huge range of all the materials that are more solid, that are more pristine looking, and perhaps they are better, they are less banal, but to my opinion, I think that that kind of defeats the point of of of, equi of working of, of these kind of laminates uh, or cladding as if you if we were to work on a real building. I think that at, at sooner or later you do have to face how to produce 
thickness with thinness in a way, right? How to be but, thick and sharp at the moment. But I want to so, poke one last thing. I want to poke at you with one last thing. It also has the quality to look like a basswood model, like an oversized basswood model, which also put you in a very awkward conversation with the Iceman cardboard houses and so on. There's a whole other aspect of that that belongs to our disciplinary conversation, which have to do with the, the scaling of things. So I, I don't know if you guys intended that, but also, yeah, it looked like it won't, it also looked like a gigantic basswood model. So there is something about that, and I think it also produced, conscious or unconscious, it, it, it kind of it, it can it, it does a claim with our internal conversation, which um, I don't know. Exactly. Um, I was just going to say, and, and yet it doesn't accurately involve any of the pieces. Yeah. And so it, it got to the point of that uselessness, that it's kind of unnameability. And, and I just think uh, that it's, it's, it's the oral quality of, of, of being able to find out and what it is to do it. And what is contemporary? What's contemporary? What's negative? Thank you. I couldn't hear the left. Oh, imagine me answering that question if this was made of real wood. That would be something I will, I will be much more liable, according to that, to that perspective, uh, than doing it with this other lightweight, fake, if you want, uh, type of materiality. Um, I don't know if I have much more to say about uh, that issue than that. I think... I think it's an important, uh, it's definitely an important topic. Perhaps my practice is not the one that answers those problems the most, but I do think that there are an, an incipient set of uh, uh, young architects right now that are taking on those issues. I'm happy to, happy to see that. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know if I can provide more, more than what I, what I just said about it. Um, um. Okay. The last one. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, and I think the, the, when these um, predecessors, the, the kind of uh, bolted buildings were originally made, they were made with solid materials, and 
the, the stones were cut in a particular way so they could compose this geometry. That's the way they will stand up. And given that set of intricacies in that type of solid materiality, they will create these type of patterns, right? Like the seams of that divide from stone to stone in order to appear that they are really physically interlocking. So the whole thing stands up. This, again, is playing with that, that kind of, um, you know, in a completely different material, you know, in this case, you know, um, um, wood or, or, or evokes wood, but it begins to work in that kind of set of interlocking set of um, um, uh, stereotomic parts that is something that we have a memory of when we look at this kind of bolts or this kind of uh, uh, material compositions in a way. Um, so I, I do think it's a great observation in that regard. I want to thank Maxi and Gia for the fantastic installation. I think it's one of the best that we have in a long time. Um, clearly, the students were completely committed and excited, so it also proved your ability as a teacher to engage with them. So uh, please go and see it. It's, the gallery is still open. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's really extraordinary. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Maxi. Thank you. Thank you.